Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Welcome to this session, which is uh, the third lecture of inflammation. We'll be discussing uh, chronic inflammation, what it is, what can lead to it. We'll talk about the different characteristics. We will talk about what are the mediators of chronic inflammation. And then we'll discuss a specific morphological type called chronic granulomatous inflammation. And then uh, finally, we will discuss about the effects of inflammation on different systems, the systemic effects of inflammation. So chronic inflammation, an inflammation which is of prolonged duration, we already discussed that. So it's inflammation that is of prolonged duration, maybe weeks to months to years. And in this inflammation, an active inflammation is going on, which is associated with a tissue injury and and at the same time there is healing taking place so remember in chronic inflammation the active inflammation the tissue injury and the healing process is continuously or simultaneously at the same time it's going on if you remember I told you that when we have inflammation it is for protection of ourselves it is for the uh, degradation of the dead necrotic tissue it is for the destroying the uh, bacteria and other microorganisms which infect our body but in order to, in, in, in order to do that uh, we have to pay a price which is of that tissue injury the leukocyte induced tissue injury and if you also remember that in chronic inflammation right in the first lecture when we were talking about acute and chronic side by side we said that tissue fibrosis and scarring is a hallmark of chronic inflammation and that tissue fibrosis and uh, healing is basically because of the tissue injury that is being done to the tissue as a result of a chronic long-term inflammation. So please keep in mind that it's an inflammation of a longer duration in which the active inflammation, the associated tissue injury and its healing is taking place at the same time simultaneously. Because healing cannot wait for inflammation to complete and then it starts, uh, it, that will never happen. So at the same time when there is injury to the tissue being taken place, at the same time the healing process is also going on. What can lead to chronic inflammation? Any acute inflammatory uh, process that stays there for a long period of time, it becomes chronic. Number two, a, any persistent infection by certain microbial agents like Mycobacterium tuberculosis. If you remember that I have told you uh, uh, in the past a, a lecture as well, that there are some microbial agents which are difficult for our immune system to eradicate. So Mycobacterium tuberculosis is one of them and uh, along with Trepanoma pallidum for syphilis and certain other viruses and fungi. So these uh, microorganisms, they sometimes, uh, they, uh, they are not eradicated fully and they're, they're present within our tissues and they can lead to a chronic inflammatory response because the trigger is staying there for a long period of time. Then exposure to certain substances, if you're having a prolonged exposure, exposure to certain substances that can lead to an inflammatory process which is going to be chronic. For example, a person works in a factory of uh, dealing with silica and he inhales that silica and it can lead to a condition called silicosis where they will have a chronic inflammation in the lungs. And this is an exogenous substance because we are inhaling it from the environment. But again, there are some substances which are produced within our body and they are also trigger factors for inflammation. For example, the cholesterols, they are going to cause atherosclerosis, which has a chronic inflammatory component of the blood vessels. So they can also lead to prolonged exposure to these substances will lead to a chronic inflammatory response. And finally, uh, Immune mediated diseases, autoimmune diseases, as you know, that in which the immune system works against our own self antigens, and they are the autoimmune disease. So the antigens are not going to go out of our body, they'll stay in, and so is our immune system. So a continuous uh, war is going to happen between these immune cells, are going to destroy the antigens all the time, and as a result of this, an inflammatory response is going to occur that will lead to the damage to the tissues and that will lead to their repair as well and this will lead to uh, a chronic inflammatory phenomena. Let's talk about this morphological features of chronic inflammation. As you remember that the main cell type in acute inflammation was neutrophils. The main cell type in the chronic inflammation are the uh, mononuclear cells. The neutrophils were polymorphonuclear cells because they have many different shapes and sizes of the nuclei in case of the uh, the neutrophils. In case of the mononuclear cells, there's just one nucleus there. 
uh, that involves macrophages it involves monocytes and it involves lymphocytes and the plasma cells plasma cells are the modified lymphocytes that produce antibodies and wherever in that in any tissue if we find these cells that shows that there is a stimulus which is persisting and it's a persistent response to that stimulus in the tissue so that means it's a chronic inflammatory response uh, the tissue destruction that takes place in the chronic inflammation, as I just told you, is because of the effect of the inflammatory cells, specifically the phagocytes, the macrophages. They release a lot of enzymes, the lysosomal enzymes. They release a lot of radical oxygen species, nitric oxides, and blah, blah. And all these, they can lead to the ingestion of the dead tissue and destruction of the, uh, uh, of the uh, microbial agent. But in doing so, they may lead to uh, tissue injury. And finally is the repair process that follows and that repair takes place by the process called fibrosis and angiogenesis. Two things happen that one is that the fibroblasts they proliferate and they, pro they, 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 uh, they deposit a lot of connective tissue that, that into that injured area. And the second phenomena is uh, the, uh, the angiogenesis uh, that there is going to be a lot of uh, uh, the uh, new blood vessels going to be formed in the healing tissue and that's a hallmark of the healing tissue we'll discuss that in detail uh, in the coming lecture if you look at this figure uh, there are two figures uh, side by side the one on the left hand side is showing chronic inflammation and one on the right hand side is showing acute inflammation if you look at the one on the left hand side you will clearly see that there is this round lesion which is called granuloma which is a specific type of chronic inflammation we'll discuss that in the coming slides and also when we zoom it you know under the microscope we see it under high power we see two kinds of cells there one are these round cells with large nuclei and small cytoplasm we call them lymphocytes and the other ones are these big macrophages which are the phagocytes with many different shapes of their nuclei and they are called they are the macrophages and presence of these two cells within the lung tissue shows that there is a chronic inflammation often it is in case of the tuberculosis well on the right hand side in the acute inflammation you see the alveolar sacs faces are filled with lots of these neutrophils which are multi which are more polymorphonuclear which are means they are neutrophils and presence of neutrophils indicates that there has been an acute inflammatory response and you can clearly see the congestion of the blood vessels if you remember that once the, there are a lot of red blood cells can you see those red things these are the congested blood vessels because most of the fluid and most of the white cells are out of the blood vessel now and what remains behind as we discussed earlier was these red blood cells which are aggregated the blood becomes viscous so these congested blood vessels and the presence of neutrophils it shows an acute inflammatory response in the lung most probably it's going to be pneumonia now let's talk about the cells of the chronic inflammation the cells of the chronic inflammation uh, they are mainly the mononuclear cells as i told you they are part of the mononuclear phagocyte system and how does this system forms first of all in the bone marrow there are the stem cells which produce the monoblast for the mono for these mononuclear cells the cell line the stem cells will produce monoblast within the bone marrow and then these monoblasts will enter the circulation we call them monocytes and from the circulation they enter into the tissues and they become they become macrophages and remember not just in the chronic inflammation that macrophages will be uh, will come to the tissues normally in us without inflammation the macrophages reside in certain tissues in order to protect the cell the our body in order to give an all-time protection that just in case in these tissues if there is a microorganism that comes or if there is an injury that these macrophages can do the macrophages can do their job so when they enter into the tissue they reside in the tissue and they are specialized cells uh, and they are called microglial cells in cns they're called kupfer cells in liver, alveolar macrophages in the lungs, and osteoclasts in case of the bone. So they're present on all these tissues to provide a full-time uh, uh, cover for any kind of microorganism that can enter in. But once the chronic inflammation takes place, their recruitment becomes even more. The more and more monocytes, they reach the tissue and then they mature into the macrophages and then these macrophages become activated. They have to activate in order to bring about their effect and once the macrophage becomes 
activated it becomes bigger in size if you can see this picture the right hand side cell is bigger cell which is the macrophage which is now activated a lots of granules are formed in it which are the lysosomal granules and as and they they have a lot of hydrolytic enzymes the proteases and stuff and they are responsible for the killing of the bacteria and the dead necrotic tissue so there, there is a mechanism which these macrophages uh, form in case of a chronic inflammatory response. So first thing is that lots of the monocytes are recruited from the circulation. So they will come and enter into the uh, tissue where there is a infection or where there is a tissue injury. And these monocytes are going to be then maturing into macrophages, number one. Number two is that any macrophages which is present in that tissue, in that area is going to proliferate. It's going to divide and make more macrophages. And then finally, when there is a good amount of macrophages there because of recruitment as well as their pro proliferation, these macrophages become immobilized. So they become immobilized at the site of the inflammation. So they stick to the main focus of inflammation because if they wander around, they will not do their job. And in, and in that case, the microorganism is going to win this battle. Uh, then once uh, it is immobilized there, then they become activated. And once they become activated, then they secrete all their enzymes. So what can activate the macrophages? The activation can come from the microbial products. For example, from the bacterial cell wall, there is a, there is a chemical called uh, endotoxin. This is a very, very potent stimulator of the macrophages. Then uh, there are certain chemical mediators of the inflammation like fibronectin. That they can also activate macrophages. And finally, as a part of the immune response, the T cells, they secrete interferon gamma. And this interferon gamma also activates the macrophages. This association or this relationship of T cells with macrophage, we are going to discuss in detail in the coming slides. Then you will understand this, uh, uh, this phenomena even better. So once these macrophages are activated by one of those signals I just discussed, then what they do, they become bigger in size, as I just mentioned. They have a lots of gra granules are formed within their cytoplasm. And then ultimately, the, the lysosomal enzymes are released. And this increases their ability to kill the ingested organisms or the, the, the ingested dead necrotic tissue. This slide, there is a figure here you see. Uh, there is a monocyte which is circulating in the blood vessel. And then there are going to be all those changes that occur in the acute inflammation like margination, rolling, firm adhesion, pavementing. And finally, you can see that this monocyte is going to transmigrate into the tissue. Once it transmigrates into the tissue, then it becomes a macrophage. Now this macrophage, as you can see in this figure, is being activated by microbial products like endotoxin, the dead necrotic tissue, as well as the interferon gamma, which has been secreted by the activated T cell. So these factors are then uh, causing this macrophage to become activated. Once it becomes activated, you see it's increased in size, lots of granules in it. It performs two functions. Macrophage is a very, very special kind of cell. On one hand, it facilitates inflammation. On the other hand, it facilitates the healing of the tissue which is injured as part of that inflammatory response. So how does it, uh, how does it, it, uh, it execute its uh, inflammatory functions and how does it can lead to injury to the tissue? It's by the production of those reactive oxygen species, the nitric oxide, the proteases, and then it produces a lots of cytokines and chemokines which recruit the inflammatory cells further to the site of, the, uh, site of injury injury or the site of infection. It causes arachidonic acid metabolites to be formed. It increases the formation of coagulation factors. And in doing that, you know, it can lead to the leukocyte induced tissue injury. And that tissue injury has to be repaired. And then this macrophage itself takes the responsibility that no, I am responsible for this and I'm going to fix it. Then on the same time, it leads to the, to the uh, secretion of the platelet derived growth factor, fibroblast growth factor and tumor growth factor beta, which in turn uh, leads to the uh, fibroblast to proliferate and lead to fibrosis as well as it leads to the, uh, to the it leads to the, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the angiogenesis to be formed, the new blood vessel. So we're going to do that in the next lectures, the angiogenesis and the, and the fibrosis.
Uh, the next uh, uh, cell is the lymphocytes. These lymphocytes, they play a very important role because they have uh, both the humoral or antibody mediated immunity as well as the cell mediated immunity. The T cells and the V cells. The V cells produce the antibodies and the T cells, they are associated with the cell mediated immunity. Both of them, they are recruited to the site of inflammation by cell adhesion molecules. Now macrophages, they display antigens to the T lymphocytes. They are also called antigen presenting cells. What they do, they the whatever bacteria they have destroyed within themselves or whatever kind of uh, dead necrotic tissue they have uh, destroyed, it's going to present it as an antigen to the T lymphocyte and in return also it's going to secrete the interleukin 12. So this interleukin 12 is going to sensitize or is going to activate the T lymphocytes. Once the T lymphocytes they become activated they secrete interferon gamma which in turn activates the macrophages. So there is a circle that goes on we will discuss that in the coming slide and this circle is going to be leading to activation of T lymphocytes by macrophages and then the activation of macrophages which is done by the lymphocytes. So there is a vicious circle that goes on. So that was the T lymphocytes, their role in this chronic inflammation. While the B lymphocytes, what they do, they produce the antibodies. And if you remember, the antibodies are very important in bringing about the hypersensitivity reactions as well as the opsonization of the bacteria. We discussed that in phagocytosis in detail. And as a result, there is a strong chronic inflammatory reaction taking place. And in, a, in the tissue where there is a lot of chronic inflammatory response, you will see so many lymphocytes as if this is a lymph node. Lymph node has a combination of lots of lymphocytes and there is also a germinal center there. So similarly, the tissue will give an appearance of a lymph node because there is going to be so many lymphocytes that are going to be recruited to uh, that specific tissue where there is a trigger of the chronic inflammation. Lymphocytes and macrophages, they have this bi-directional relationship. What I have been saying in the last couple of slides, we're going to see it here. You see this macrophage which is activated, it secretes the uh, interleukin-12 as well as it presents the antigen to the T-cells. This leads to the T-cell activation. Which activated T-cell is going to be, T-lymphocyte is going to secrete interferon gamma, which is very important for activation of macrophage. As well as it is going to secrete tumor necrosis factor, the master cytokine, which is going to lead to many things of inflammation and mainly the recruitment of lots of other leukocytes to that site of the injury or the infection. So once the interferon gamma, which is secreted by T-lymphocytes, it stimulates the macrophage, the macrophage becomes further activated. It's going to secrete more interleukin 12 is going to activate T lymphocyte even more and then this circle keeps on going and going and going unless the inflammation has subsided or it has stopped and the neutralization of the mediators takes place uh, uh, in the inflammatory mediators they are neutralized by certain chemicals then and and the inflammatory response is gone Plasma cells are the other cells. They are modif modified lymphocytes, B lymphocytes. They produce antibodies. Mast cells, they have a role in both acute and chronic inflammatory response. They bind to the IgE antibody and they are responsible for the, especially the type 1 hypersensitivity reaction. They have the histamine, serotonin, and they are, uh, these granules are secreted in case of the inflammatory responses. Similarly, eosinophils, they are, uh, uh, they are the cells which are, uh, they are going to be predominant in case of the parasitic infections mediated by the IgE antibodies and the main chemotactic factors, this is a very important factor which is called eotaxin. Eotaxin is the chemotactic substance that is responsible for the, uh, this is responsible for the, the chemotaxis of the eosinophils to the site of the injury uh, or the infection. Uh, neutrophils uh, are, the, are the cell types which are mainly the cell types of acute inflammation but they are also present in the chronic inflammation. They, they will be present and but you remember they will not stay more than uh, those 24 hours and they will be replaced by the monocytes but remember uh, neutrophils are the main cell types of acute inflammation but there will be other cells present in the acute inflammation too but the main cells are neutrophils similarly in chronic inflammation the main cells are the macrophages lymphocytes and the plasma cells but there could be neutrophils present there as well let's talk about the two types of chronic inflammation the two types are 
divided into non-specific and specific chronic inflammation. In non-specific inflammation, there is no specific architecture or histology of the uh, of the uh, uh, tissue. Uh, there are going to be accumulation of the macrophages, the lymphocytes, and the plasma cells, and this is going to be uh, this is going to be uh, the uh, appearance of a chronic inflammatory tissue where there is chronic inflammation where there is no specific appearance in that tissue while in specific chronic inflammation we also call it chronic granulomatous inflammation there is a specific histological appearance of uh, the, the the chronic inflammatory response and we call that a round lesion which is called granuloma I we discussed a little bit about it with caseation necrosis in the necrosis, but today we're going to discuss that in detail. So, which diseases can lead to a chronic inflammation where there is formation of granuloma, which is a specific histological appearance of a tissue when it is having a chronic granulomatous inflammation? So, these are tuberculosis, leprosy, and syphilis. Let's focus on now chronic granulomatous inflammation. The chronic granulomatous inflammation uh, involves formation of granuloma, as the as the name says. And this granuloma is the combination of all those cells which we discussed, which are the cells of the chronic inflammation, the lymphocytes, and the macrophages, but in a specialized manner. Granuloma is composed of modified macrophages, which are called epithelioid cells. Normally, the macrophages have a very are big. They have uh, many different kind of uh, uh, irregular uh, cell membrane and a big nucleus. But when they modify into epithelioid cells, they become more like elongated. And these epithelioid cells are then surrounded by the lymphocytes and the giant cells and the fibroblasts. The giant cells are actually the macrophages, but when these more than one or um, uh, more than the two or more than that, the macrophages, they join each other, they fuse with each other and they make a big cell. That's why it's called giant cell. And this cell, because it is formed by the merger of many different uh, macrophages, then it is called multinucleated giant cell because it has multiple nuclei. Now, these giant cells are further of two types, Langhan types giant cells and foreign body giant cells. The Langhan giant cells, these multiple nuclei which are present in them, they are present in the form of a special uh, 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 architecture. They are in a U-shaped manner. They are lying inside the cytoplasm of the giant cell in the form of a U or a horseshoe shape. And that's called a Langhan giant cell. But foreign body giant cell, these nuclei are present there. There are multiple nuclei in the big giant cell, but they don't have any specific arrangement. They are haphazardly present within the cytoplasm of the giant cell. So granulomas are of two types, uh, caseating granulomas and non-caseating granulomas. Remember, granuloma is the specific histological lesion of the chronic granulomatous inflammation. But this granuloma has two types in it. One is caseating granuloma and one is non-caseating granuloma. Caseating granulomas are those in which in the center of the lesion and the center of the granuloma is present uh, that necrotic tissue which is the caseation necrosis. While in non-caseating granulomas there is no central caseation necrosis present. So if you have a look at this figure on the right hand side at the upper corner you can see that this is a granuloma which is a non-caseating granuloma because there is no central caseation necrosis in it compared to the one below where you can clearly see there is a caseation necrosis in the center. We will discuss them side by side in the next slide but just for now see that in the middle there are these epithelioid cells which are modified macrophages these epithelial cells are then surrounded by a collar of a rim of the lymphocytes. These blue dots are the lymphocytes because their lymphocytes are round cells with big nucleus, so they stain blue. And then there is this giant cell, and you can see that the nuclei are present not in any special manner, but they are haphazard, so they are foreign body giant cells. So you can clearly see those giant cells. And finally, surrounding these lymphocytes, epithelial cells, and the giant cells is the layer of the fibroblasts. Remember, chronic inflammation, there is going to be repair going on along with the acute, acute active inflammation. So these fibroblasts will be involved in the repair phenomenon. 
then you see that these multinuclear giant cells they are the, uh, the foreign body type giant cells in case of non caseating granuloma but in the caseation granuloma you see there is a central caseation necrosis there so in the middle there will be necrosis Cessation necrosis, which is a granular area, it is going to contain the uh, the amorphous, uh, white, cheesy, dead necrotic tissue, as we discussed it in the necrosis. This is surrounded by the epithelioid cells, which in turn are surrounded by those lymphocytes and the giant cells. And this type in the giant cells are the are the Langhan type giant cells. You can clearly see that there is a specific U-shaped manner these nuclei are arranged in these. Uh, uh, giant cells so and then this is followed by the uh, surrounded by the fibroblasts uh, and this is the caseation uh, necrosis and caseating granuloma and remember the granuloma is always healed by fibrosis so there is going to be repair by the process of fibrosis where there's going to be a lot of collagen and connective tissue deposition we'll discuss this fibrosis in the coming lecture just a comparison of a non-caseating and caseating granuloma you can see that there is a central caseation in the caseating granuloma which is on the right hand side and there is no central caseation necrosis in the in the non-caseating granuloma then you see that the giant cells are the langhan type giant cells in the non-caseating granuloma while in the caseating granuloma there is going to be this horseshoe shaped nuclei the langhan types uh, giant cells This is an actual histopathological picture, a microscopy of the tissue from the lung which we have taken. You can clearly see this pink amorphous material in the middle is the central caseation necrosis, which is surrounded by certain epithelite cells and the giant cells are very, very clear here. You can see the U-shaped nuclei, the Langhan types giant cells. And then it is surrounded by these very, you see these blue dots which are surrounding, which are making a rim, a circle around these giant cells. These are the lymphocytes and the lymphocytes are surrounded then by a layer of the fibroblasts which is not pretty clear in this picture at least. But this is just to show you that the granuloma is a round lesion which is clear as soon as we look at the tissue in the microscope. So there are many different etiologies for these granulomatous inflammation. There are infective granulomas which are caused by certain infections like tuberculosis. Uh, caused by mycobacterium tuberculosis, leprosy by mycobacterium leprae, trypanoma pallidum causing syphilis, cat scratch disease, listeriosis by listeria, brucellosis by brucella, and then there are certain, this is going to cause infective granulomas, then, then there is going to be a foreign body granulomas will can be formed because of exogenous materials that can enter our body like asbestosis, silicosis, talc and certain sutures so if we leave a suture behind which is not dissolvable not absorbable that suture will lead to chronic inflammation in that area and will lead to formation of a granuloma the function of granuloma is basically to to restrict any kind of infection to spread out so and then it wants to these cells want to just uh, close down on this uh, uh, mycobacterium tuberculosis or any other infective material or any other foreign material and then want to kill it and digest it and then there are some immune uh, granulomas as well which are related to the uh, to the autoimmunity and that can happen in the Crohn's disease. This uh, slide just tells you the different kind of diseases or conditions where there can be granulomatous inflammation and uh, and the and the materials or the microbial organisms which are responsible for them. Now we come to the systemic effects of inflammation. An inflammation that may occur in, now we have done the chronic inflammation, now we're just talking about the systemic effects of journal inflammation. And remember one thing, uh, systemic effect means that if the inflammation is occurring in any tissue of the body, maybe we're having tonsillitis. Maybe we are having pharyngitis, maybe we are having appendicitis, but what does this inflammation, what changes it brings in the other systems of the body? The first thing is the acute phase reaction. Uh, these are the systemic inflammatory response. There is secretion of the certain cytokines, excessive secretion of master cytokines, TNF and interleukin-1, and also interleukin-6. They are produced by the leukocytes and certain other cells which are involved in the inflammatory response. This interleukin-6 along with the master cytokines,
cytokines is responsible for the secretion of ex increased levels of the react acute phase reaction uh, re reactive proteins like CRP C reactive protein uh, they are increased in the blood fibrinogen is increased in the blood serum amyloid A protein is increased in the blood why they are increased in the blood because of excessive secretion of the interleukin 6 in, in an inflammatory response and that interleukin 6 leads to increased production of these proteins by the liver then there is a raised erythrocyte sedimentation rate ESR this is often increased in chronic in inflammatory diseases what happens then is that there is a excessive production of a mediator of the chronic inflammation the fibrinogen this fibrinogen it binds to the erythrocytes make them heavy and then they they are going to deposit in the formation of layers uh, within the uh, the tube which contains the blood and then ESR is raised this is called rule formation normally we measure after putting in a special tube the blood we measure how much it the red blood cells they settle down in the first hour but in case of a chronic inflammatory disease because fibrinogen binds to the erythrocytes it is going to lead to an excessive number of RBCs to uh, uh, to become settled down in the bottom uh, uh, of that uh, the ESR tube and this is called rule formation Leukocytosis, this is a very important systemic effect of the inflammation. Whenever there's going to be inflammation, the master cytokines which are released in the inflammatory response, TNF, and uh, tumor necrosis factor interleukin 1 what they do they cause the bone marrow to cause more and more and more white cells to be produced this is called leukocytosis normal count is 4000 to 11000 but in case of the inflammatory response it may become from 5 15000 to even 20000 and among this raised leukocyte count if we think if we find out that there are more neutrophils then that means that the source of the inflammation is bacterial if among that leukocytosis the main cell type is the eosinophils then it is because of some parasitic infection or viral or an hypersensitivity reaction due to some allergen if these increased leukocyte count has more lymphocytes in it called lymphocytosis then it is going to be the viral infection that is a cause of that inflammation but remember there are always exceptions not always an inflammation can lead to increased white cell count because there are certain microorganisms like typhoid fever the salmonella typhi certain viruses rickets C and protozoa what they do they cause the bone marrow to be suppressed they don't let the bone marrow to produce the blast cells of that specific cell line and as a result there is a decrease in the white cell count why because the inflammation is draining the white cells from the circulation and bone marrow is not producing the uh, the, the the cells which are required because these viruses and these uh, bacteria like salmonella typhi which cause typhoid fever they have their mechanisms to suppress our bone marrow and this leads to decreased circulating white blood cells we call that leukopenia then fever is another uh, one of the factors uh, that uh, one of the effects of inflammation normally we have a hypothalamus which is our uh, our thermostat for controlling the temperature whenever our temperature goes beyond 37 degrees celsius hypothalamus is responsible for certain different mechanisms to lower down our temperature but in inflammation that thermostat is raised by one to four degrees celsius and only when temperature goes above one to four degrees celsius above than the normal value that the body will start functioning to radiate heat and bring it the uh, the temperature back to 37 degrees celsius how is this thermostat raised it is raised because the exogenous pathogens from the bacteria they lead to excessive production of the master cytokines interleukin 1 and tnf these master cytokines then affect the endothelial cells of hypothalamus and they lead to excessive formation of prostaglandins by causing the arachidonic acid to be metabolized by cyclooxygenase 2 and then this will lead to the fever and the NSAIDs which we give the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs they basically halt this uh, conversion of the uh, uh, the arachidonic acids to uh, the prostaglandins uh, in the hypothalamus and this fever is associated then with anorexia, fatigue, myalgias and certain other responses. 
So we can have increased heart rate, rigors and chills, and anorexia because of an inflammatory response. And there is a phenomenon called cachexia, which is called the wasting syndrome. Uh, in cachexia, what happens is that the person becomes weaker, his body and muscles get wasted, he loses a lot of weight, and this is because of excessive production of tumor necrosis factor. This happens in chronic inflammation as well as in cancers. And what does this TNF do? It reduces your appetite. The person who is a chronic inflammatory disease or a cancer, he is not feeling like eating anything. When he does not eat anything, the body needs glucose and then the, the lipids, the fats and the proteins, they break down to lead to the formation of glucose. And that's why in chronic inflammatory diseases, there is always going to be weight loss. In severe bacterial infections, high levels of the TNF, what they do, they lead to disseminated intravascular coagulation, hypoglycemia and hypotension, which are features of a septic shock. We'll discuss that in detail in the hemodynamics, but remember that increased levels of TNF because of a severe inflammatory response, it can actually lead to death by going into the septic shock. We will discuss that in detail in the hemodynamics. So thank you very much for staying with me and uh, see you next time in the lecture of uh, the, the, the tissue repair and uh, uh, this is going to be two lectures on tissue repair. Thank you very much.